Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on the Conscious Resistance Network and Conscious Resistance YouTube channel. So today we have Bill Bupert, who's a, um, he's the founder of ZeroGov.com and author of ZeroGov, the book, which you can find on Amazon. So, so Bill, tell us a little bit about um, how you became an anarchist. Well, I, uh, I, because the word language is really important because the word anarchist makes certain people fill their pants. A lot of people fill their pants. And because you and I as anarcho capitalists happen to be three to 5%, they say by the numbers of libertarians, really? because oh, okay. most libertarians are minarchist. Yeah. They believe in unicorns <laughs> and, and UFOs and Sasquatch, which is why they believe in limited government, which is an historical impossibility. So I refer to myself as an abolitionist. I find it's, it's much more clear-cut. And I'm all about voluntary virtues, by the way. I think that's a, a, a splendid way to describe what you're undertaking. As an abolitionist, though, it opens up all kinds of tender ministrations during conversation in which a person will say, oh, an abolitionist. I thought that they banned slavery in the 19th century. And I say, well, they haven't quite finished. Or they'll say, what's an abolitionist? And I'll say, I'm opposed to the ownership of other human beings. What ownership of other human beings do you support? Uh -huh. So it makes for all kinds of conversational repose and dialogue that can get real interesting. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great that's a great um, concept. Abolitionist. I, I, I talk about that as well. In that, uh, you know, the abolitionists of the past that opposed chain slavery, you know, did not foresee the uh, you know the appearance of uh, you know industrial machines. Um, that would till the soil in the place of slaves, right? They for they 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 oppose slavery on on moral grounds primarily, right? Which but is, they didn't take it far enough. Yeah, true. Because true. they thought that I will liberate them from that plantation, but I won't liberate them from all plantations. Yeah, true. So now we have Lincoln in 1865, where just before he assumed room temperature at the hands of John Wilkes Booth, one of my heroes, <laughs> we discover that he's on the veranda at the White House rocking on his rocking chair and saying now everyone's on my plantation yeah quite right no. I, mean, I mean and no. and and the uh you know the fact that the whole civil war you know basically um was about preventing the south from peacefully seceding you know basically set the precedent Indeed. basically set the precedent for you know a tyrannical federal government that would swell and uh you know, to enormous proportions that we see today, right? <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, and unfortunately, the the war of northern aggression or the war between the states, the war for southern independence, whatever you want to call it, that particular war not only fashioned the sophisticated manacles that we suffer under now, which are constitutional manacles, by the way, but it also ushered in the kind of modern warfare that was waged in which men, women, and children were the object of destruction on the part of the military forces of the U.S. at the time. And that, of course, would set a pattern for future American military conflict when they started conducting their war on the world in 1893, after they had finished savaging the American aboriginals from coast to coast and ran out of brown people to kill. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, Lincoln is one of the um, the presidents that you know in your government school they they really uh, harp on him as one of the saviors, right? Of, uh, well, of, of course they do. You look at Woodrow Wilson, you look at FDR. It seems that the president that has, that has the most blood in his hands, where, you, where he's standing knee-deep in a lake of it, he's the one who they like and admire so much. You know, it's funny you should say that because I uh, recently uh, got into a debate, which I posted on my channel, with uh, one of my friends who was um, defending uh, government, basically, in direct democracy. And I posed a direct question to him, asking him, do you think the president is a mass murderer? And he outright says, of course not. How can you say that? <laughs> he has nothing to do with that. Everything he did was lawful and was authorized by Congress, by the Constitution, by the, you know, all this, <laughs> all this stuff. And indeed, but he's correct. It was authorized by the Constitution because that document – and you probably heard me say this before if you listen to any of my other podcasts, is probably one of the most demonic and clever instruments to make a slave people think they are free and to convince them that they are and to allow this totalitarian enterprise at the U.S. government to do what it does both abroad and domestically 
under this constitutional edict. But the Constitution is it's it's a very fancy set of chains and manacles and plantation fences for the tax cattle here in the U.S. I am not a a constitutionalist by by the by the weakest stripe. I think it it's a fetid document in my mind. The anti federalists were right. Oh yeah, they smelled a rat, and that's exactly <laughs> what it was. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, the way I look at at um, you know looking at the uh, the chain of of command, or, or as I like to call it, the chain of obedience, is that every single person in a chain is to be held accountable, right? Because we all have a choice, right, to follow orders or not to follow orders, right? So at no point can you absolve yourself of responsibility, right? Which is what government attempts to do, right? Diffuse responsibility throughout. So, you know, who can you blame for the murder? You can't blame anyone, right? <laughs> That's right. You, you and I are thinking simpatico. I mean, we are thinking along the exact same lines because question authority is sexy, but question obedience is where the rubber hits the road. That's where you put your money where your myths are because that's where you say, you know what? I'm not going to submit. I just wrote a, a blog essay called uh, Hold Death Deer. I think you may have read it. You, oh, yeah. you mentioned that yeah. in our correspondence. Yeah. And what I'm, I'm, I'm a capitalist stoic by practice philosophically, and I just fin finished a four-part series with Brett V over at School Sucks Podcast on that very thing. And riffing off the stoic concept, the stoics said that in this life, we are the res ones responsible for our own character and virtue, and it is our responsibility to obey those edicts which we think are consonant with our own moral values. And what I said in Hold Death Dear is that the state will vanish because once everybody stands up and says, you know what, you can pummel me, you can cage me, or like I like to say about the police state today in America, you can find me, cage me kidnap me, maim me or kill me, depending on my level of resistance, but you will not have my obedience and I will submit my refusal only. That would destroy all governments planet-wide. They couldn't exist if people didn't obey because fear is the mortar and, and, and obedience is the brick. And that is the house of government. Yeah, nicely put. It's true. Yeah. And, and I don't even think that a, you know, a significant majority have to uh, resist, you know, even peacefully resist, right? Because um, so few people, you know, as a percentage, according to how many people are in government, um, you know, just a few of them who are resolute, I think will, after you reach a certain point, I think it's called the hundredth, hundredth monkey effect, right? After you reach a certain point, yeah. you know, everybody else will just, um, um, you know, how you say, mimic those people who are passionate and then that's how you have change, right? <laughs> yeah. In, in classic irregular warfare studies, they found that in the Western construct, it say, takes less than 3% of a given population to go to war in a guerrilla fashion and maybe even prevail in a guerrilla fashion. What you have is like the first American Revolution from 1775 to 1783, where 30% of the population sat on the fence. 30% were loyal Tories. 30% were just wanted to throw the colonial yoke off and assume their own mantle of leadership of themselves. The other 10% is sort of like a margin of error. But it's usually a classic one-third, one-third, one-third throughout the time of Western civilization from Rome until today where it takes that 3% to really do that. Here's a, for instance, during the Irish Rebellion, which was an 800-year occupation until it essentially ended in 1922 with the establishment of the Irish Free State on the island of Eyre, E-I-R-E, -E, which is a southern island, two islands of, of Ireland. It, in 1916, you had the Irish rising. Well, so in 1922, in those six years, they managed to wrest this yoke, this 800-year occupation, by the United Kingdom away from themselves. But 1922, and this is what always happens, what do they want to do? They don't want to make the transition to a no-state phase. They want to say, you're a socialist, I'm a socialist, we're going to fight to see who the winning socialist is. They did. The socialists won because two socialists were fighting. So in 1922, you have a socialist Ireland. And between 1922 and I would say 1999, when Sinn Féin, the political wing of the IRA, finally succeeded in wresting the second part of this English domination away from them, what you had was up to 500 paramilitaries in the Irish Republican Army, the provost, and all the other variations of it post-World War II against 45 to 55,000 
Ruck, which was Royal Ulster Constabulary, Irish police forces, English police forces, and British military forces. So think of what that ratio was. That ratio is extraordinary. If we look at Leto Vorbeck and his fight during World War I in German East Africa, where at the end of four years, in 1918, he is the only undefeated German general on the face of planet Earth. He has less than 11,000 men, and he has bested estimates from 300,000 to 650,000, and he has bested 250 generals who were sent against him in that four-year period of time. Look at the ratios again. So these ratios can be astonishing when you study history. So all I'm saying with a, with a rather long-winded response is you're right. <laughs> it takes a small force calculus to, to prevail. Gandhi's Satyagraha campaigns where he says, you know what? I'm going to go make my own salt. The British gave him a wood shampoo. The British gave his followers a wood shampoo. They prevailed in the end. Despite the beatings, the blood, and the killings, they prevail in the end because they had the moral high ground, which is the important thing for on Voluntary Virtues uh, Network, what you do as an ANCAP spoke, spokesman and podcaster. What you're doing is you're saying, I have the moral high ground and I can't go back. I can't go back to what I was. It is impossible because I would have to forfeit my moral compass to do so. Because what I'd have to say is I'd have to say a little bit of slavery is all right. And I can't do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I always tell people that it's not the degree, the degree to which we are controlled or to the degree to which our money is extorted. It's the fact that there exists an institution that claims the right to extort and the right to control, right? Because the percentage can be changed at, at a whim, right? That's as Indeed. Regard, regardless, yeah. right? <laughs> Well, I mean, lo- look at the income tax. Oh, yeah. You know, I hate, I hate all taxes across the board. Income tax comes out in the beginning of the century in the United States, the beginning of the 20th century in the United States. And I think it was less than 2% on very few people within the country. But if you made over 50000 or 100000 which was a lot of money at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, mm-hmm. less than 30 mm-hmm. years later, 1943, we get a peak marginal income tax rate of, wait for it, Ninety-four percent. Ninety-four percent. On every pe- every dollar you make over a hundred thousand yeah. dollars, you're going to surrender ninety-four cents Ooh. to the federal government, mm. and it's just what you said because we said so. Yeah, and who's- I mean, it's thuggery. It's organized thuggery. That's what it is. It's a gang of bandits with flags. Mm-hmm. That's what government is. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So so t- tell me a little bit about your history in the uh, in the military and what you experienced. <laughs> Well, I I, uh, I grew up rather po. We had tires on our roof, so I was uh, I wouldn't say I was disadvantaged. I was just I just didn't have as much money as everybody else did, nor did my family. So, at the age of seventeen, as a high school dropout, I entered the uh, the military, and I spent the next twenty four years there, both active duty and as a reservist when I went to college, so I can get my commission. And the only reason I got my commission to become a commission officer is because I could get more money that way. So, uh, I retired in two thousand and three. Took almost four years off, and then in 2007, rejoined the workforce. And my evolution as a libertarian and further as an abolitionist started to take shape in the late 90s, which was probably the last half dozen plus years of my service, where I was just starting to to read the history and look at things. I mean, I I was a uh, I went to uni- one of my postings was to university where I was an assistant professor of military science. So I taught a bunch of classes. I love teaching. And I got to teach those. Well, I had to read. And I taught history while I was there. And I had to read. I had to deprogram myself from 10,000 years, 10,000 hours of government schooling because I'd gone to college all where right. <laughs> all they'd done was told me the wrong history. All they'd done was teach me how to be obedient. You know, like government civics class, they should re- rename it government obedience class because that's what it is. And then they go on and on about, well, our wars are glorious and the president is the highest human on earth and the United States has done such great things. Well, Rothbard, Murray Rothbard, inspired me to dig. And I dig and I dug and I dug some more. And I discovered that everything I learned in government school was a goddamn lie. So I made it a project for myself to reinvent my intellect, to try to deprogram myself and in the best stoic fashion to learn the right history instead of the wrong history. Because 
And the reason I put so much emphasis on history is that if we don't know where we've been, we can't possibly know where we are. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And, and isn't, it, isn't it quite sad how, you know, like you said, we have to deprogram ourselves. We have to expel all this status excrement that was, <laughs> that was forced into our brains, <laughs> you, know? you know, when we were impressionable right. young children. And, yes. and, and just imagine if those 12 years had gone differently, if we were actually... Um, able to pursue the those things that we were actually interested in, you know, where would we be today, right? <laughs> because now we're well, basically we, recovering. <laughs> we home educated our children, and as a result of that, I I have uh, one child left at home of my five, and the uh, the other four have gone their way, and the majority of my children are ANCAPs. Really? Wow! That's and great. I and I gave them the choice. I mean, I for instance, I'm not a religionist, but we took them to church and we exposed them to that. And if they wanted to go to church with friends, I said, please do so because I want you to come to your own conclusions. And I also said, if you become a principled Marxist, that's great. As long as you could defend Socratically what you believe in. Otherwise you're just a, a billboard, you know, a human billboard filled with the excrement that you just described, <laughs> you know, where you haven't done the proper philosophical drilling oh, to know yeah. why you think the way you do. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're actually also, uh, we have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and we, uh, I'm the stay-at-home father, and I most certainly will be keeping them as far away as possible from those Fantastic. indoctrination centers, and, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of sad, you know, when I see the school buses go by, because, uh, you know, w when you realize that they use the same vehicle to transport prisoners, right, as they do to transport <laughs> children. <laughs> and they look like prisons, don't they? And when you they, go outside oh, these government education complexes, just, they do. It's just horrible. And, and it's yeah. amazing that I, I didn't really realize it. You know, you don't realize it when you're going through it, but now when you look back on it, um, it's amazing. It's like, you know, when, when the government takes control of a sector of society, that sector basically freezes in time, right? And <laughs> And if it moves, if it improves, it does so at like molasses type speed, <laughs> you know, whereas the internet and Skype, everything is like lightning speed already. And they're still using, I don't know if they're still using calculators or what, or what they're using, but. Of course they are, but it's not about education in the government schools. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's a mind laundry right. to, to have these indoctrinated automatons who will bow at the knee every time they're told to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so. I mean, I mean. Just forget about the information they teach. Just, just think about what the the kind of um, you know principles or morals they're trying to instill, which is you know always defer to authority. You know, you have no freedom of expression, no freedom of speech. Right? You you, you don't have the the ability. Wait, a bell's to... gone off. I have to stop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, the creativity is just destroyed completely. It is. Critical know? thinking is given lip service, but they won't teach it. Oh, it's it's really amazing, yeah. and then not, that's not yeah. even mentioning the you know the um, the what do you call it the Pledge of Allegiance, which is completely socialist. <laughs> yes, it is. Raise your right hand. Oh my God! Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I tell people, what's the difference between doing this or doing this? You know, they're they're really, yeah. You know, well, actually, though, up until 1939, that's what they did: is they raised their right hand. True. Quite right. For yeah. the pledge, yeah. And, and yeah. did they change that because Hitler was associated with that? I guess it became unfashionable, even though Hitler, Stalin, and no, it was Hitler and Stalin who were Times Men of the Year, and Mussolini. Yeah, right, 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 right. And right. Mussolini, yeah. <laughs> so they, lo they love the big state. Yeah. Always have. Amazing, yeah, yeah. yeah America's not about freedom. America's about more efficiently shearing the tax cattle. Oh, yeah. Quite right. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. that reminds me of a, a, a video that, that Larkin Rose recently made, uh, um, which is... Um, What's so What's so bad about the Nazis? <laughs> and he's basically posing the question. You know, what is the difference? The fundamental difference between the Nazis, um, you know, in the in the nineteen thirties and forties, and the federal government as it stands today. I think that's wonderful, and I posed that question <laughs> in the past where I've said, now apart from the National Socialists' rather nasty streak of liquidating those people that they didn't like, mm -hmm. how do you like the way they form their society other than liquidation? <laughs> There's nothing they would disagree with because. They're government supremacists, left and right. They're government supremacists. Conservatives and liberals, they're both creatures of the warfare welfare state. Yeah, right, quite right. And and that, and yeah. the uh, and I think the majority of the tax paying citizens at that time in uh, in Nazi Germany were aware of what was going on. You know, were aware of the concentration camps. Yet most of them acted out of fear. You know, continuing to work, pay their taxes, support you know yeah. support the troops. I don't agree with what the troops are doing, but we have to support the troops. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we were just talking about Nazi Germany and how um, 
you know, I really don't see much of a difference. Even even if they say, you know, they murdered all these people. Okay, the the Native Americans, <laughs> Native American genocide, you know, all the world wars, you know, the the two uh, Japanese city that were nuked, you know, how <laughs> how much and how much and by the way, were they progressive Democrats in charge who put us into World War One, World War Two? Korea and the Vietnam War, because if you listen to lefties today, and I, and by the way, a quick, pre, I, I hate that description, description of left to right, because I don't think that it is a, uh, it's a proper descriptor, because the proper descriptor is, you're either a coercionist, or you're a voluntarist, you're either an individualist, or you're a collectivist. Mm-hmm. It's not left or right, because the right is just as collectivist today, as the left is. But the left is so proud today, even though all their anti-war murmurs stopped in 2008, when their resident got in the awful office, what you discover is that they say, yeah, we're, we're all about peace. We're anti-war. Well, no, you're not. <laughs> Historically, no, you're not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, it's kind of funny when I start talking to people about volunteerism and anarchy, one of the most common uh, responses is, what right-wing nut are you listening to? <laughs> Isn't that and funny? People think I'm a Republican. I'm like, no, I'm of off course. the spectrum. I'm not, yes, I'm, we are. You know, I'm not. You don't even consider me there. So even, though, even I think that I think that's because you and I know that. I'm being presumptuous when I say this. I think that politics is the ruination of a man's moral compass. I think that it it steals all his virtue away, because Acton said. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. But Bupert's corollary to Acton's axiom is that power attracts the corruptible and that absolute power attracts even worse. And that's what we have today. Like you just mentioned that you had a direct democracy debate with somebody. Yep. yep. I think democracy is just an awful system and not simply in a Churchillian sense where he said, well, it's the most awful. It's it's the worst system, but it's the best one we have. Mm -hmm. Something to that effect. Mm -hmm. Churchill, the statist monster that he was. Mm -hmm. But democracy is nothing more than mob rule. It's majoritarian tyranny. It means that you assume when you pull that lever, that is proxy violence where you make an assumption that your neighbors are your property to dispose of as you wish. Wow. (laughs) That's an incredible leap. Yeah, 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 so, and it and it turns everyone into a little dictator, like just like you said, everyone yes, tries does. to control his neighbor and force him to uh, bend to bend to your will, right? Um, has has anyone in your audience suffered by being in a homeowners association? They will see one of the lowest forms of this kind of uh, dictatorial behavior in the, in their neighbors. You, you know, so, you know, it's funny. Um, yeah. I I got from some people when I talk about this, they say, well. How can you be against government? It's just like if you were living in a condo association. It's just the same thing. You know, you're living in a place. You're it's pay- just you're, as you're, bad. You're, yes. pay- you're paying rent. You're, you know, you're, uh, you have services that they provide to you. And <laughs> to, which I, to which I say, of course not. It's completely different, right? When, when the day, and, and actually they say it's just like a condo association or, or a, a club or a church gathering. A government is the exact same thing. And, and I say, well, of course it isn't, because once you have the ability for a condo association to wage war against another condo association, okay, then it's like government. You know, when you have a chess club that can print its own money, okay, then it's like the federal <laughs> government, right? When you have a church organization that can spy on its own citizens, right, with massive surveillance state, okay, then a church is like the federal government. But these are these are the same people who insist that you and I, our notions of anarchy are impossible, yet they practice them every evening when they go home. Yeah, exactly. They practice it every weekend with friends and family and neighbors and every day. I suspect, I'm hoping, that a lot of them behave not because they're being afraid of of being assaulted and maimed by cockroaches, but that they do it because of their own moral virtue. Because in their hearts they say, you know what? And I don't believe in altruism as a positive thing. They probably say, you know it's in my self-interest to be kind to my neighbors because maybe karma will come around. Maybe this is going to work in my, maybe this isn't a zero sum solution. Maybe just maybe if we cooperate and we persuade each other and we come around, things will be better for all of us. And that sounds a little flowery and it sounds a little hippy drippy, but that's what makes ANCAP so different from the rest is because we don't want peace at home. We want peace on the planet. We don't just want to stop war abroad. We want to stop war at home. And the government wages war on its citizens every day. For instance, 
I mentioned I'm not a religionist, but I'm probably a cultural Christian. I think the Ten Commandments are pretty good as a set of laws and rules, but no government on earth in the past or today can exist without violating every one of them on a daily basis to exist. No government cannot do things such as, have you seen this latest notion where they say bullying, we want to stop school bullying, right? Mm -hmm. Well, why would you stop the very modus that you use to conduct yourself every day? (laughs) What would happen if the government made bullying illegal and couldn't do it? (laughs) Would you pay your taxes? I wouldn't. Would you obey the cockroaches? I wouldn't. I wouldn't do anything they told me. But they live by threat of force. Oh yeah. So. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, people, yeah, have this this uh, fantasy notion that the government is there to protect property and individual rights. Isn't that funny? It because is. Because they think you and I are the fantasists. <laughs> they do. You listen to them and they say, oh, those crazy caps, those crazy anarchists, they think that people can live together without a gun screwed to their head to make them do the right thing. What are they thinking? <laughs> crazy anarchists. And I look at them and I think, who's the... Who's the jester now? You know, it's it's you because here's a – I got to say this again. And I've said it on other podcasts. Here's one of the beautiful things about capitalism. Two – maybe they're armed strangers, but they keep their weapons in their holster. Two armed strangers come together and they exchange goods and services. They leave with a smile and a handshake and they leave. There's no threat of force. Neither one of them pulled a gun out, put it to the other side and say, take this or I'm taking your wallet or anything like that. They both left happy in a cooperative, peaceful, and persuasive effort in which they were both happy after they left. That's pretty good. Government doesn't act that way because government is ultimately a death cult. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. In the end, in the end, they are a death cult. Every single law, every single tax, every single regulation, you can just add at the end, or we will kill you. (laughs) That sums it up. I think we can stop the program. Right. I mean, uh, you know, it, sometimes it's, it's monumentally difficult to get people to recognize the force that's um, that's backed by every piece of legislation, you know. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and then again, sometimes it's monumentally difficult to get people to recognize that taxation is theft, right? Because... People don't want to admit that they're being robbed, right? So they would they would rather say, no, it's voluntary. I'm choosing to pay my taxes or I enjoy paying my taxes. <laughs> or they're handcuffed and they're on the ground and they're getting the starch beat out of them or a wood shampoo administered by the cockroaches and they're saying, I need more of this. I need more government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of sad. Like the people who... Um, who advocate for something like socialism or communism, you know, I think uh, those those kind of people are the ones who have not experienced socialism or communism. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> right? Agreed. It's like, uh, I, I guess American universities are one of the last large intellectual enclaves for Marxism. Yeah. You know, on planet Earth. <laughs> because there's not a lot of that going on in Russia and the former, former Warsaw Pact nations. Now, I think there's a lot of it going on in the EU, and there's a lot of it going on in America. But other places, they've seen what that's like and they don't quite like the results. Talking about the tertiary education, what, do you, what are your thoughts on Obama's uh, recent uh, you know, um, <laughs> new legislation he's trying to get passed about free community, free college, free community college, something like oh, that? Oh, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's so funny. Usually I don't speak to, because this is Bush's fourth term. So I, I don't like to usually speak to contemporaneous political arrangements because they always end badly. But nonetheless, I'll, I'll, I'll treat that question. And nothing's free. It has to be paid for by somebody. Oh, yeah. It's like what drives me nuts about this $1.2 trillion estimate for student debt. Mm-hmm. Here's my principal question when it comes to student debt. I know for a fact there is no evidence of a single student who was forced to sign for that loan. Mm-hmm. None whatsoever. So if they signed a contract... What, what, oh, I see why they're crying. They're crying because they don't want to fulfill the contract and they're hiding under the government's skirts, hoping the government will either relieve them of their duties to the contract or pat them on the head and say, we'll take care of that for you. Forg- yeah. Forgiveness, right? Forgiveness. Yeah, forgiveness. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think there's no such thing as free when it comes to the government. For instance, those yellow submarines you were talking about earlier, the, the, um, the school buses. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine how much that costs every year. 
if you took every one of those yellow buses, the maintenance, the fuel, mm -hmm. stopping, starting, the pollution, mm -hmm. all that stuff, I'll bet that racks up hundreds of millions of dollars. If we have to have a government education system, which I don't believe in, why can't parents bring their own children to the jailhouse? Why, why, why do they have to send you know, this, this yellow submarine by to pick up their children to bring them to jail for the day? Yeah, yeah. Why do they have to do that? And, and, and it extends further into so many things that they shouldn't do. You know, why do we have a helium plant or two or three in Texas for World War I dirigible subsidies? Why do we have mohair subsidies in the United States to this day? Sam Donaldson, that, that newscaster, I don't know whether he's still alive or not. He used to be on the Sunday uh, political state filleting shows. He, he, had, uh, he had sheep, so he got mo mohair subsidies. Why are there mohair subsidies? For Korean War era uniforms for the troops that went over there to kill yellow people. That's why they, they never go away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so if we so if we do this thing that you're talking about, where there's free education at a subsidized education at community colleges, it'll never go away. It's like the National Socialist healthcare mm -hmm. that they're trying to foist upon everybody. It'll never go away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I hear that from uh, from a lot of people who come from Europe. You know, they say, oh yeah, they, they say we Europe. It's so great. Um, healthcare is free. <laughs> this is free. You know, you just go pass a test, and college is free. This is free. That's free. <laughs> you know. Well, the best the best line I've ever heard when it comes to that is that if you think if you think it's expensive now, wait till it's free. Yeah, I think PG yeah. PJ O'Rourke yeah. is it right? <laughs> yeah, I think I think so. Yeah. You know, you have two and four year old children. Well, at one time you had unborn children, like all parents did. The government not only taxes citizens, but it taxes the unborn. Through, through funded debt and other such schemes, through the Federal Reserve, things like that. Mm. Talk about no moral compass. That's just amazing to me. Yeah, I mean, and, and then, you know, talk about, you know, the social contract where, where the kids are, you know, automatically indebted from the moment they're born. <laughs> you know, they, they assume all this debt that our previous generations have racked up, you know, um, and we're supposed to be grateful. <laughs> Jean-Jacques Jean Rousseau, the author of the, the social contract, as, as we realize it in the Western world today, that he penned in the 18th century, he had such highfalutin intellectual ideas and philosophical wings. Yet what does he do with all five of his children? He sends them off and he abandons them and never sees them again. Right. That was his social contract. Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about your book and, and what, you, uh, what you wrote about well, my book is called Zero Gov, Limited Government, Unicorns, and Other Mythological Creatures, which is available on Amazon for $2.99, dirt cheap. <laughs> it's a compilation of my essays, and I need to revise and update it so I can include more essays because I try to write one or two essays a, work, a, a week on my blog, zerogov.com, the latest of which was Hold Death Deer and, the, um, and how, we, how We Can Make the State Vanish by doing that. So I'm working on a novel right now that I'm halfway through. I plotted out all 32 chapters. It's called The Cancer Club. It's about four widowers in America who decide, since they all have terminal illnesses and since they're rather disgruntled with the direction that the country is going in, they decide to go out with a bang, and there is a lot of cockroach carnage in it. And then I'm writing two books next year, one of which is taking all six volumes of Lysander Spooner's collective works and elucidating that in one volume for folks and another book on the relationship between ancient stoicism and the modern abolitionist movement. So that's my book and those are my book projects that I have in mind. Wow. And okay, so yeah. so, so there it's a compilation of your all of your previous essays, right? The, the one that you It is. It is. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I have uh... It's funny if if I may, it was so funny when you said um I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you. And he said, so you make a living off of your blog and your books and such. And uh, like all other liberty people with very few exceptions, I don't make a dime off of liberty. It's simply a, a philosophical passion. So Yeah, it's amazing. You know, we, you know, we volunteers who, who stumble upon this fascinating stuff, we, um, we want to share it with as many people as possible. Unfortunately, you know, we also yeah. have to eat. <laughs> we have to feed our kids and our, our family. <laughs> And so you have to make concessions, right? Yeah. So you, you either sleep or you write an essay, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So That's right. It gets, it gets difficult. But, uh, 
I mean, when you're passionate about something, you know, I assume the abolitionists of the uh, the 19th century also were very passionate about what they were doing. They were well. rather passionate. Yes, right? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that we're uh, comparable to their... So what you, and I, what you and I are doing is we're taking what Wilberforce did at the turn of the 19th century, where he stood in the parliament in England and, and looked at the left and the right side of the aisles. And he said, the ownership of other human beings is morally wrong. He said this as a, as a practicing and very um, fervent Christian, which is, he based his on biblical scripture. Of course, you had plenty of slavers throughout history, especially in the West, who have used the Bible as the fundamental document supporting owning other human beings. So again, it's all up to your interpretation. But you and I are taking Wilberforce to the next level. You and I are philosophically terraforming the planet one disobedient surf at a time. That's that's our charter. I um, got the motto from one of my one of my friends: uh, "One mind at a time." Because you know it, it gets overwhelming. You know when you when you're surrounded by all these people who have all these uh, you know um, harmful and destructive ideas about government and politics and the economy, and and you just want to correct everything, but but you can't. You know you have to focus. You have to calm down, take a deep breath. You know, do a little bit of writing, maybe do a little bit of podcasting, and maybe talk to people. Wherever you are, you know, you go to the you go to the mall, you go to the bank, you go to the post office, wherever you are, you know, this this is just what I try to do, you know, always try to get people to think about things that they would not normally think about. I'm rather insular when I'm out in public. Uh, it, it's me and my Kindle. So really, you know, if I'm standing in line or whatever, because what I've discovered is that I don't start the conversations anymore. If people engage me, then I'll engage in that. One of the reasons for that is I have this catharsis. You know, I can be invited to your great podcast, you know, where I can talk about this stuff with, with somebody who really knows their stuff mm -hmm. when it comes to ANCAP. Because for the most part, most of my fellow citizens who don't share the philosophical pedigree that you and I do think we've landed from Mars. <laughs> yeah, they, exactly. they simply don't understand. They don't understand this concept that a free society and a peaceful society shouldn't be formed by violence. Now, they're of the mind that they live in a society that employs violence to good ends, but it uses a very irrational calculus, which is that immoral means will equal moral ends, and that's impossible. Mm -hmm. It can't happen that way. It hasn't happened that way. It's just like that whole notion of limited government. Come on. <laughs> Come on. When does that ever happen? You you were just raped a little bit. You're just a little bit pregnant. No, you're just a you're just a little fat. No, you're just a wee bit evil. Yeah. No, that person's not quite dead. He's not dead yet. Yeah. So yeah, to me, to me, um, you know, talk, what you just said, you know, using um, immorality to achieve peace is like fighting, you know, um, you know, fighting for peace, right? Or screwing for virginity, right? As George Carlin yeah, would say. <laughs> yeah, vo voting for freedom is like fornicating for for uh, virginity. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, That's right. And. Yeah. Uh, you know, or might might equals right, which is which is essentially what um, you know. You can you democracy can is. Yeah, you can uh, you can yeah. associate that with government as well as um, authoritarian yeah. parenting. You know, with spanking mm -hmm. and corporal punishment, yeah. and you know, I'm bigger, I'm stronger. You know, therefore I'm right. Right? <laughs> it doesn't matter if I'm my arguments are logically sound. No, <laughs> I'm stronger. I can hurt you. <laughs> therefore, which is actually a, a logical fallacy. I think uh, um, at baculum, which is uh, the appeal to the stick. Right? Because I can. I can hurt you, I can beat you, I can cage you, then I'm right. <laughs> well, that's the American police state, too. Basically what it comes down to, yeah. 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 I, I, are you yeah. familiar with any of uh, Mark Stevens' work? I am, indeed. Mark and I are friends. Awesome, yeah, yeah. We're I, fellow I, jazz aficionados. Are you? Cool. I, uh, yeah, I, I interviewed him also, and he's a really fascinating guy. Uh, he's a great guy. guy you I know, like he, him. I, he, he really, I like his approach, too, you know, how he goes into the court system and he, and he challenges them directly there. You know, there's not too many, yeah. there's not too many um, you know, voluntarists who, who take that route. You know, that's he's pretty, doing something I would never do. Yeah, that's pretty, it's very brave. <laughs> I would I would never go in front of robed government employees and try to change their minds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he asked them point blank, you know, the questions that nobody dares to yeah. ask, you know, and yep. uh, he does a great job. He does a great job of pointing out the gun in the room, right? Yes, he does. Because everybody everybody, you know, is kind and cordial and does not want to admit the force that's involved when you go to court, right? With the subpoena, with But when you're sta when you're standing in court, let's suppose that you're a defendant there. You are the you and your defense attorney are the only non-government employees. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, t- talk about a conflict of interest. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of people don't see it like that. You know, like, um, you know, talking about checks and balances, you know, people have this idea, oh, we have checks and balances, you know, legislative, executive, judicial, you know, they're all equal, they can... They can check each other, you know. That's that's so funny. <laughs> that's just so funny. Are you a gun guy? You know, um, well, I support I support everything with guns, but I do not yeah. own one myself. Okay, I'm a gun guy, and what I use when when people talk about the Supreme Court and when they talk about the um, the right to bear arms and the constitutional Second Amendment and this whole notion that the there's these three co-equal branches that are different and have these checks and balances. If the Second Amendment is so sacrosanct, then how come the 1934 National Firearms Act, the 1968 Gun Control Act, the 1986 mcclure volkmer fopa Act, the 1989 Import Ban on the Cosmetically Offensive Weapons, the NICS, the Brady Bill, the AWB, the NICS Improvement Act of 2007? So none of that violates the Second Amendment. I just want to get this straight, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Tom uh, Woods. <laughs> Tom Woods would tell us, and I think I'm paraphrasing. Between 1935 and present day, there has not been a major piece of legislation nor department that has been harmed in any fashion by the robed government employees. None. Yeah. They've continued expanding. Of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's the nature of government basically is to continue it to expand. It certainly is. It's like a virus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. and the only limit to its expansion would be the, you know, the extent to which the industrious can be robbed of their productivity right or that's right or that's right or when basically people stop believing in authority that certain people have the moral right to rule over other people right and and that's what our that's what our i saw is. this great anarchist meme too it's got pictures from this famous movie i think it was the wolf of wall street i think that's what it was mm-hmm. and it's it's a picture of of where he says well people are violent and people are this and people are bad and this is a, and he says that's why we need government to which the guy responds, but people run the government. <laughs> Silence, crickets, crickets. Yeah. So, <laughs> and yeah. are, are, are the best of people going to seek political office and seek to be cop roaches and seek to be enforcement arms and seek to yeah. expand and maintain the state? No, they're not. You're going to get the worst of humanity. It's, it's a cacocracy, which is ruled by the worst, <laughs> ruled by those with the least merit. Yeah, yeah, I think you know, so um, it's it's like a it's it's a Milgram Stanford experiment that's harnessed to the Stockholm syndrome and you've got cacocratic elements at the top that control it all. <laughs> oh, the Stanley Milgram experiment, that's an excellent thing. I, I talk to people a lot when, you know, everyday law abiding, tax paying citizen, you know, I'm a decent person. I'm a good person, you know. How can you say, you know, there's so much evil and and, and violence in the world, you know? <laughs> but, you know, when people are around authority figures, all of a sudden their mentality shifts, right? And perception of reality is distorted, right? And people can do really heinous things <laughs> because somebody told them to do it, you know, who has a white lab coat or is in, you know, has a special badge or has a special uniform, right? <laughs> it's the because I- it all comes down to fear. Yeah. Because fear feeds obedience. Because yeah. without fear, why would you obey? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the desire to please those in authority, you know, it seems to me that that harkens back to, you know, growing up in an authoritarian household, right, with, you know, very strict authoritarian parenting that uh, demands respect, does not earn respect, but demands respect. (laughs) I think it's also a human genetic meme where most human beings are hardwired to obey. Mm. I think it's interesting, and this is sheer speculation, Celts tend to be anti-authoritarian to the core. That's not all of them, but they tend to be. They tend to engage in fisticuffs over points of honor, like in the American South, things like that. So I think that there may be, I'd, I'd love for, this is what I call a vexing question, which is a question I don't have the answer to, but there are people out there smarter who may do a TED Talk about it, who can say, yeah, that's right, or no, that's wrong. For instance, is there a libertarian gene? Are, you know, we've heard this talk of oppositional defiance syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Celeste, that's me, to which I always respond, well, obviously you have liberty deficit disorder. So, 
Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think there's uh, probably a medication associated with it right by now. <laughs> I am certain that there is. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. A, it's amazing, you know, how psychiatry has developed. You know, it's just ballooned all these, uh, you know, fabricated mental disorders. And I it, recommend The Myth of Mental Illness by Thomas Sass. Okay. It's a great corrective to that. It's S Z A S Z. Mm-hmm. Thomas Sass. Sass. Okay. Amazon. I'm I'll yeah. check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Psychiatry is, is, is a, I, I, I learned a little bit about the history of psychiatry, and it's really, really bloody history. But it's, it's just it amazing. A, you know, it's, yes, it is. It's amazing how that's another, that's another branch of, of, uh, you know, of medicine that it functions based on basically faith because there's no physical test that you can do to diagnose, you know, bipolars or schizophrenia or, you know, um, any any number of the uh, psychiatric disorders that are coming out in the uh, in the what is it the, um, the 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 manual that comes out every every few years. I know the one you're talking about, that death side manual. D D S O M, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, I've had family members who have suffered from some of those disorders that you described. Could they be precisely those disorders? Maybe, maybe not. I, for instance, uh, my my father had some of that. He had bundles of symptoms that would meet that, but they weren't perfect bundles. They were just symptoms of what it would be like. I happen to be autistic. I have Asperger's. Ah. So, I mean, all of us, maybe I'll, I, I also pride myself on thinking that if it weren't for autism, we wouldn't have the computer revolution that we have today. Because <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I read about Steve Jobs and when I watch the film that was made about him, there was a documentary about Steve Jobs. He has a lot of autistic tendencies. Really? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so. Never, never, never heard yeah. about that about him. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I don't want to keep it too long. So, um, why don't you let people know where they can find your work if they want to uh, contact you? Any well, websites? I'm at zerogov.com, and you can contact me via my uh, my website. I also have a forum, and you could find that forum in a tab. And we have a band of uh, we have the Brotherhood Without Banners that flies their non-existent banners with pride on the forum. And there's a lot of very interesting and spicy discussion going on there all the time. And I have my book, of course, Zero Gov, Limited Government, Unicorns, and Other Mythological Creatures. And I have also formed my own consulting firm called the Gravitas Group, which will specialize in leadership consulting. So that's where people can get in touch with me. I'm building that website right now. So you're not on Facebook at all, right? No, I've never had a Facebook account, nor will I. Is there a reason for that? Any specific reason? Yeah, I'm not a very social animal. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I have. I, you know, I'm a. I'm a. Uh, I'm an Enneagram Five INTJ. So I find that I've. Uh, I've got. I recharge by being alone, and I'm also trying to wean myself off of too much screen time because mm-hmm. I find that. Screens are dominating our existence, and by dominating our existence, it's starting to take an effect on on my cognition and other people's cognition. Because I have a lot of books, as you can look around in in my little library here. Yeah. <laughs> Reading doesn't take place until you take your eyes off the page, hmm. because it's reflection and 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 contemplation. For instance, after I finish this delightful podcast with you, I'm probably going to sit back for five minutes and reflect on the great conversation that we have because. What we're doing right now, this human interaction, is so bloody important and it's disappearing. Because how many times have you walked down the street or the road or you've been in the supermarket or whatever and people are, are looking down at their screens like this? Yeah. They're not interacting with uh, any other human beings. I mean, there, there's, there's distances that we have to establish at, as human beings to make sure that our souls and our, our intellects remain ours and don't become lost in the crowd. For instance, Plato and Socrates had their distance because they would leave Athens. They'd walk out beyond the city walls, they'd go to a brook or a stream, and they'd have a conversation, or they'd go out there and they'd be alone. How often are people alone today? Mm-hmm. Without a screen, not very often. That kind of reminds me yeah. of, a, of a, a picture that I saw on, on Facebook. <laughs> you see, a, you see a bus, uh, you know, a, a, I guess a public bus in the, like the 1950s, black and white picture, <clears throat> and you see everybody, everybody with their newspaper. Nobody's talking to anybody, right? Everybody with their newspaper, and then it says, "Yes, technology has made us, um, you know, antisocial." <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so basically, you know, we've always been like this, right? It's, it's not necessarily, yeah. Yeah. you know, the electronic devices. Got it. Well, you know, it wasn't until the 4th century AD in which there was the f- first recorded event where somebody conducted silent reading. Because up until the Gutenberg Revolution, books were very expensive to produce. And when they were produced, they were produced by mostly religious institutions. But they were produced to be rather large and rather expensive. And the the print was rather large. And people would gather around in the room and they'd be read to. Silent reading, what we do today, that started happening in the 4th century AD, but only to the select few who could afford books. With the Gutenberg Revolution, what we see is within 100 years, Tens of millions of different books are published, and people are reading silently for the first time. And again, speaking to inner distance, it was a way to really revolutionize human cognition when you think about it, because we could quite literally travel in our armchairs around the world through different philosophical constructs, uh, through another person's perception and vision of how they saw the world in a novel or something like that. So so books were revolutionary. So I, I guess that's why I'm so concerned about having even for extroverts, sufficient alone time or sufficient time. Like you and I, I'll bet we could go to a local coffee house, hopefully not Starbucks because the coffee is too bitter to, to, uh, to share a cup of, or we'd go to a pub and, and share some fine dark beers, something like that. And we'd have a conversation for hours, I suspect. And we'd have a great time doing it. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think I could yeah. do that. Yeah. Um, all right. So why don't you leave my, uh, the listeners with any last message that you'd like, you'd like them to hear? You know, the, it, the, the only thing that I'd like them to take away from this entire conversation is not only to continue watching Voluntary Virtues Network and the, these great podcasts that you put together, but to realize that their freedom is their business and that if you want ultimate freedom and you want freedom for your children, don't wait for anybody else to do it. You have to grab it yourself. Well said. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> and continue philosophically terraforming the planet one disobedient surf at a time. Yes, one mind at a time. Awesome. That's right. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much, Bill, for the conversation. Well, thanks. I really appreciate it. No problem. So this is um, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.